Hi there, and welcome back to History of Graphic Narratives. In this lecture, we're going to look at the visual elements and modes of graphic narratives. That is, how we can start to talk about comics and graphic narratives and try and understand the special way in which they communicate to us. Perhaps one of the most important ideas in storytelling, in pictures, is that a picture is really synchronic. In a way, we can kind of take the whole thing in all at once. And yet a story always has a beginning, middle, and an end. We may not always see every part of the story, but it suggests or implicates the idea of something happening over time. So in this picture here, John Furnival's semiotic folk poem from 1966, we're looking at a picture that tells a story. But how are we to understand this picture story, this graphic narrative? How are we to make sense of what we're looking at? It just looks like a random assortment of triangles and circles and hatch marks. And yet, if we're given a clue where the symbols are suddenly can be identified as figures, laddie and lassie, boy and girl, and rye, we start to see how these figures and the landscape interact. And it starts to suggest this sort of amorous liaison of a boy and girl rolling around in the hay. And so this way in which the story tells through a picture is a really wonderful and unique phenomenon. It's unlike a visual story. It's not like we can translate this into words. It's really communicating to us in a very original, spatial, dynamic way that our eye takes in without translating into any kind of verbal equivalent. So a graphic narrative, what we're talking about in this class, is not just looking at a picture, it's really reading a picture, which means to sort of make sense of it over time, how we understand one moment to the next. And in representing a story or the possibility of a story, it's often a series of pictures or separate images within a picture that allow us to sort of parse out that this is the one moment and this is the next moment. In a typical comic, such as Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy, we can see a series of panels set aside by frames. In each panel, we read like we would a book from left to right. And in this, we can see uh, a path that leads us through this. And we can see from what we know of these conventions, the speech bubble that hangs above and has what's called a tail that comes down and directs us to understand that that character is speaking. And then we also see water spraying and other sort of things that are happening that let us understand certain kinds of actions. So now the path, we start to read this. We first see Nancy, our furthest, most dramatic thing, closest to us, or framed by the fence. So her eye leads in, and we see her peeking in on this scene where she sees Sluggo spraying this other little girl. We move to the next panel, and we see Sluggo hitting the boy with the squirt gun, saying the exact same thing. Now, in the third act, we see Nancy is prepared. She has got herself this hose in her holster, and here comes Sluggo, and he's about to draw, and we don't see the last moment. We're looking to Sluggo's action, and Sluggo's looking back to her, his intended victim, but she's ready for him. And that's where the comic ends. We can anticipate this because we understand the humor. Even though it's not shown, a number of things are not shown. One, we don't actually see what is in the holster. We can imagine it's one of those sort of gun-shaped spray nozzles, which in the 1950s, when this came out, was a new uh, lawn tool that people found popular. And that sort of clues us in. 
And we can also imagine that Nancy is ultimately going to be victorious in this duel. And that's where the humor arrives. He comes to show us these things without actually spelling it out in a really kind of fun and inventive way. Now, if you look at this path, you see her eye does not just follow a single linear direction, but it kind of doubles back. It moves through the space in a very dynamic way. And that's what you have to be sensitive to in reading a comic, is your eye is not going to be like reading words on a page, starting here and ending there. It's really flowing through the whole space of the picture. So part of what we need to understand a comic is this idea of literacy. You know, we have to be able to read the words, of course, but also moving and knowing to move from generally left to right, in our case, in English, and caricature, that these characters are stylized, that they have exaggerated features and expressions and the movements, everything about their bodies is kind of simplified anatomy. This is called a caricature, which makes them very easy to read and we understand the, the character involved. And then lastly, this idea of sequential action, that one picture leads to another and it's consequential, meaning it comes to this point from that point, and because these things are building, we know that the sequence is growing in intensity and the humor is going to arrive consequentially from what came before. This is a really unique and modern phenomenon, the sequential action. And that's what we're going to discover here is how did sequential action come into being and how does it really manifest itself in modern comics today? One of the first guys to really popularize the idea of looking at comics critically, he wanted to get at the idea of what is the essential elements of a comic. How can we talk about the form of comics without particularly talking about the styles and taste and subject matter and themes? And this is where I am particularly interested in comics, is trying to understand not just the content, superheroes, what have you, is not to mistake the message for the messenger, that there's some form of these things that tells us how to understand them. And we are really invisible to us. And that's what this class, I hope, does, is sort of help you understand the way these pictures tell stories. First of all, let's just talk about pictures. If you haven't ever taken an art history class, or I suppose you haven't, and if you're not really familiar with how pictures work, a really fun example is this surrealist painting by Magritte called The Treachery of Images. And in it, we see a picture of a pipe. And then there is a text below it in French where it says, this is not a pipe. Well, there's a paradox here. We can clearly see what we're looking at is a pipe. But he is reminding us in his treachery of images that the picture is not actually the real thing. It is an icon of the thing. It is a representation of the thing. And so when we look at a picture of a pipe, it's not like we're looking at a actual pipe. We're looking at the artist's rendition of it. And so that's the nature of representation, that this is not a car. This is not a country, this is not a face, a cow, this is not music. And yet we take these things, these representations, these, we have to sort of learn to accept these things as things, sort of standing in for the thing. And we sort of enter into this understanding that we are kind of interpreting and reading and making sense of these representations. Now, not all representations are particularly literal. And that what Scott McCloud wants to point out is that there's a range of possible ways in which representation can appear to us. It can be like a photograph where we're looking at something very specific, or it could be something extremely generic that basically says we're looking at a face with no individual personality at all. And then within this range, we can see that we're either including no one, one particular person, or we're including everyone in this representation. 
And that changes the way we understand the ideas that we are looking at. The way he explains this way we think in images is that if you are talking to someone and you're looking at them, you see their face before you and their appearance to you is as real and as plain as day. And so we often associate the other, someone else, in this kind of realistic mode. But at the same time, as we're speaking, we are sort of dimly aware of our own facial features, what we're doing. And that sort of simplified version of our face is how we sense and experience ourselves. And so that this is how comics operate. In that simplified caricature we saw of Nancy and Sluggo, we identify with them more because their simplified features sort of register not as someone outside us, as this other thing, but we get to kind of role play in reading these comics. And we get to assume the roles because it sort of conforms to how we see ourselves. All right, this is all theory here. No one's actually proven this, but it's an interesting idea and one to consider about the effects that different kinds of representation have on the way we read comics. Now, there are some other ideas that I want you to be aware of when we're looking at comics. One is how the artist approaches the way they render the picture. This is not exactly style. Style refers to something broader that several different artists might adopt. But when an artist has a very distinctive way of doing things, and that's part of their sort of signature approach to art, we call that facture. And this becomes really popular in the 19th century with a number of painters like Edouard Manet. And their approach to art was very idiosyncratic for the first time. They weren't adopting a style. They were really asserting their own view. And this is a really important part of how we read comics, is this very individuated way in which the artist is showing you not only this thing, but also their approach and their view of the thing. Okay, so this individual way in which the artist approaches drawing, and also the way they tell the story. Okay, so that's the facture. Not to be confused with factura. Factura is kind of related. It's part of what the artist chooses, but it's different in the sense that we are more aware, not of the artist per se, but the materiality of the picture. Materiality is kind of a fancy word for saying that we're aware that we're looking at a picture. Okay, we're, we're always sort of aware that we're looking at a picture. There isn't this sense of a suspension of disbelief where we are duped into believing we're actually seeing the real thing. Instead, what we're looking at is when we're made aware of the fact that it's this assemblage of images, that it's a, the, the physical form of the picture, whether it's the Bende dots that are very visible on the face, and we're suddenly aware of the fact we're looking at a picture because the heavy lines and the character of the picture is very graphic in a way that we see it for what it is and we read it. It makes it more difficult to assume that what we're looking at is an illusion of the thing itself, or if it's a collage. And the scale and the form of the picture is jumbled and or the sense that we're looking at an assemblage of things rather than a uniform picture. Factura is a very modern idea that allows us to become aware of the physical materiality of the image. And this is another very important idea that we look at start to study graphic narratives. So, the last really interesting element that we have to contend with in our discussion of comic form is the relationship between words and pictures. Some comics are very dependent on the use of words, that without words, the comic is almost meaningless. And some comics 
have almost no words whatsoever. They tell the story almost like a movie, a series of pictures that we are sort of looking into. And so it's really interesting to mark, you know, the role that words play in the orientation of the story. So is it the words that are driving the story or is it the pictures that are driving the story? Very often you might find some kind of combination. And that's where you are looking at a picture. In this case, we can see one picture is like a map as the character is sort of planning their attempt to re-encounter this woman. So he's going to quickly run around the block. And as he's running, he's thinking about what he's going to say when he meets this girl. And we can see how his thoughts are shifting and changing as he's running. This is a really fun way in which the character of the drawing, we can see the way in which the frame of his thoughts and the color of the background sets it apart from the actual picture. And so this is a very graphic way of communicating a story. This is a way in which the story is really kind of a, a word, and the word is a picture. And the picture is kind of graphic in the way that words are. And this sort of interdependent way is a really fun and very imaginative and original way that comics can communicate. The last kind of narrative structure that we're going to talk about and form in the graphic narrative is called mode. And there are quite a number of different kinds of modes in graphic narrative. We'll probably talk about 13. Uh, not to be overwhelmed, I'm just going to introduce the idea here. A monoscenic narrative is where the whole story is depicted in a single picture, where you can see a vase. And on that face is a single picture. And this is episode, a very important episode from a well-known story. So people looking at that picture would remember the story from it. Okay, so that would be a single autonomous picture with no repetition of any character. So that you have single characters, single scene. And then you have a linear narrative. This is a different kind of story where now you have repetition of characters. And you have a series of images in a row. These are stacked on top of each other so that there are 12. And these are the tortures of a saint. And so the tortures are kind of all shown there. Now, the order of the tortures is not really very important. There's sort of a beginning and there is an end where his head gets chopped off. But the actual sequence is not so important, okay? And so this is part of this idea of the linear narrative. It's a collection of images that are shown in a single direction, but they don't really have causality like we talked about in the sequential images of the Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy earlier, okay? So that's just an introduction to some of these ideas that we'll be talking about in this class, and it's a chance for you to start to think critically about what you're reading. All right, catch you later.